Next up is the body. So, what do we want the body to do? The main thing is that we want it to be able to bend and twist around without the bottom of the body sliding around. If the bottom slides around when we bend the body, then the animator would have to counter animate to keep it from sliding, which is bad. As with the finger, the simplest way to accomplish this is just to use a simple bone chain. If the base of the chain is on the ground, then rotations won't make the body slide around. However, a pure FK chain has a different kind of counter animation problem. If we rotate the bottom of the body, but we want the top to stay in the same orientation, then we have to counter rotate. For a character like this, there are probably lots of situations where it would be nice to have easy independent control over the rotation of the top and bottom of the body, so this is important to address. Another thing to consider is that for a simple character like this, it would be nice for the middle bones of the chain to automatically form a smooth bend based on the orientation of the top and bottom bone. Doing this would, unfortunately, remove some control from the animator, but it would also make the rig simpler to use and faster to animate with. It's a trade-off, and it's a trade-off that may not be good, depending on what the rig is going to be used for, but let's assume that the trade-off is a good one for this rig. To accomplish these goals, we're going to need to delve a little deeper into constraints. Let's take a look at these two bones here. If we add a copy rotation constraint between them, and rotate this bone, then the other bone follows its rotation. Old news, I know, but here's the interesting thing. It doesn't have to fully copy the bone's rotation. If we go to the bone constraint properties, we see that at the bottom of the constraint, there's a slider called influence. This determines how much the constraint affects the bone. It's kind of like an alpha value for constraints. So for example, if we set it to 0.5, then when we rotate this bone, the constrained bone only rotates half as much. But it gets even better than this. So far, we have only ever added one constraint to a bone, but the constraint system in Blender allows layering of constraints. Let's add a third bone to the armature. And let's add a second copy rotation constraint using this bone. Now in the constraint properties, we can see that there are not just one, but two constraints, one on top of the other. This is called the constraint stack. Constraints in the constraint stack affect objects and bones in top to bottom order. So this constraint is applied to the object before this constraint. So as things are right now, the first constraint makes the bone copy the rotation of this bone halfway, and then the second constraint makes it copy the rotation of this bone completely. In other words, Right now, the second constraint is completely overwriting the first, because the second constraint has full influence and is placed later in the constraint stack. But let's try changing this. Set the first constraint to full influence, and set the second constraint to half influence. Now if we rotate the bones, the constrained bone stays exactly halfway between the rotation of both. This is because the first constraint puts the bone in the same rotation as our first bone, and the second constraint then rotates it halfway towards our third bone. Now if we leave the bones rotated, and we play with the second constraint slider, we can see the effects more clearly. When the slider is at zero, the bone copies the first bone entirely. This is because the second constraint now has zero influence. It might as well not even exist. But as we slide the influence towards one, the constrained bone rotates towards the third bone, copying it entirely when we reach one. It's just like alpha values in image editing. Just remember that the stack starts at the top and goes to the bottom, not the other way around. If you want to move where a constraint is in the stack, you can use the up and down arrows here. Something else to be aware of is that some constraints don't really interact with each other. So for example, if we add a copy location constraint, the rotation constraints don't get overridden. Only constraints that affect rotation will override them. This is important because otherwise, we wouldn't really be able to constrain both the location and rotation of a bone or object. We could only use one or the other. The last thing to note about constraints is to reiterate that they use transform matrices and do not affect the transform values in the end panel. These transform values are turned into a transform matrix, 
and that matrix is then fed into the top of the constraint stack, getting modified by each constraint in turn, and it's finally spit out at the bottom as the final transform matrix of the object. One way that this matters to us riggers is that because matrices only represent 360 degrees of rotation, rotation constraints with partial influence can cause flipping when you hit 180 degrees. There isn't really any way for the constraint system to know which way around you want the bone to blend, so it always just picks the shortest route. Another way that this matters to us as riggers is that because the matrix is created from the transform channels, constraints are almost always applied after drivers, since we need the driven transform values to construct the transform matrix. There are a very few exceptions to this, but as a general rule this is true. So let's apply these lessons to create a nice body rig for Mr. Hot Dog. The goal here is to constrain the two middle bones to be a blend of the rotation of the first and last bones. But there's a gotcha in there. To constrain the middle two bones like that, they need to partially copy the rotation of the last bone. But the rotation of the last bone is affected by the middle two bones due to the parent-child relationship. This is called a cyclic dependency, because this bone's rotation depends on that bone's rotation. But that bone's rotation depends on this bone's rotation. It's a cycle, it's, it's like a paradox, it's unsolvable. So what we need to do instead is create another bone that's entirely outside of this parent-child hierarchy, and that will be the control for the top of the body. Then we can have all three of these bones influenced by it. Similarly, we're going to create a separate bone to be the control for the bottom of the body. This isn't strictly necessary because using the base bone directly wouldn't actually create any cyclic dependencies, but I like to do it this way for consistency. So let's do that. Add two more bones with the same orientation. And now let's make sure that all of the bones are aligned the same way, because otherwise in the default pose, the constraints might actually cause some rotations. Looks like they aren't really aligned, so let's roll them into place. Now, the top and bottom bones of the chain really just need to directly copy the rotation of their respective controls, so just use a single copy rotation constraint for each. If we rotate the controls now, we can see the effect that this has. Now constrain the middle two bones to the bottom control with copy rotation constraints. Again, this isn't strictly necessary, since they follow its rotation due to the parent-child relationship anyway, but I like to do it this way. Next constrain them to the top control. Now if we play with the controls, the situation sort of looks reversed, with the middle two bones following the top control instead of the bottom. Leave the top control rotated, and now select the third bone in the chain, and go to its constraints. We can now tweak the influence of the second constraint to get the blend we want, and since we left the top control rotated, we can directly see the effect that this tweaking is having. And we can also do the same thing for the other bone. And in fact, we can just go back and forth, tweaking both, until we get something that we're happy with. That seems fine. Now what happens when we play with the controls? Ooh, fun! We can control the rotation of the top and bottom independently of each other, and the middle bones automatically bend smoothly to accommodate that. However, something that would be even cooler than this would be if the controls affected all of the transforms. Right now the only thing that's affected is rotation, but what if we could scale the bones too and have it blend nicely as well? For that I'm going to introduce a new constraint. Delete all the constraints we already have. Now we want to do the same thing as before, except instead of using copy rotation constraints, we're going to use copy transform constraints. Notice that the bottom bone immediately snapped to the bottom control's position. That's because the copy transforms constraint doesn't just copy rotation, it also copies location and scale. In fact, what it actually does is it just makes an exact copy of the other bone's transform matrix, which means it also copies things like shear as well. In any case, it's, it's pretty confusing having the control and bottom bone overlap exactly, so let's scale the control up a bit in edit mode. And let's do the same for the top control as well.
And other than that, just follow the exact same process as before, just using copy transforms instead of copy rotations. One thing to notice is that the copy transforms on the other bones don't snap them to the same location as the constraining bone. That's because they're in a connected chain, and therefore are unable to move away from their connected locations, even with constraints. In this case, that's exactly what we want. But if we didn't want that, we could always disconnect the bones. Now let's play with this. Cool. Now the scale gets nicely blended across the chain as well. Which means if the animator wants, they could actually do some kind of squash and stretch with this rig. There are just two more things to do. First, we don't really want the top control floating out in the middle of nowhere. We want it to move with the body rig. So let's constrain its location to the bottom control. Second, we don't want bones to move from their default positions unless the animator has moved them. So let's place the bones in edit mode such that they stay put even with the constraints applied. And we're done! When we create this for the final rig, of course, we'll give the controls shapes that make this less visually confusing. But as far as the mechanics of the rigging go, we've got a pretty nice thing going on here.